and trauma studies, theories of combined and uneven development, and trans-Indigenous studies. He is also editor and communications manager of Xanthos Journal. Dr. Habil Yudit is the director of international relations at the University of Physical Education in Budapest, Hungary. She taught American and Canadian culture studies for 25 years with a focus on ethnic and multicultural studies. She published a textbook, Critical Perspectives on English Canadian Literature, has received multiple research grants and holds a temporary lecturing position at GCSU and taught and did research at UNM. Her PhD focused on alternative histories in recent Western Canadian fiction. She has studied the psychological and sociological implications of the gone indigenous passage rights and has studied the psychological and sociological, oh, Hannah has published a book, there we go, uh, titled Going Indian, Cultural Appropriation in Recent North American Literature. Currently, she explores mixed blood narratives and identity negotiation in the SW literature and recent Nuevo Mexicano and Canadian Métis writing, respectively. Ananya is a PhD candidate in the Faculty of English at the University of Cambridge, working on comparative Indigenous literatures and political identity from India, Australia and North America. She is the convener of Climate Fictions, Indigenous Studies Research Network at Cambridge, and co-founder of Untold Histories Museum Tools at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, an initiative to decolonize Cambridge Museum collections and labels. Doro is a Rural Research Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study, University of Warwick. In her multifaceted research, she investigates how aesthetics is a manner of drawing people into an effective relationship with the lacunae of knowledge and histories. In The Powers of the False, she explores how literature can help to represent histories that would otherwise remain ineffable. In her current project, titled Side by Side, Reading Indigenous and Non-Indigenous Literature, she asks which epistemological, formal and thematic distinctions and connections are present in post-war fiction on native North America on both sides of the Atlantic. She holds a focus on transcultural epistemology and the relationship between literature and historiography. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Abdenua to present his research titled Traumatic Modernities, Traumatized Peripheralities, a trans-Indigenous reading of colonial traumas in Kim Scott's Taboo and Tommy Orange's There There. Over to you, Abdua. Thank you, Holly. Can, 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 you, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, I will try to uh, share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I don't think it's possible. I don't know. Like there is a, I think there is a, a small problem. It, ca it normally comes up with a second, sc a second screen with a little blue button share in the bottom. Share. Like when you click share screen at the bottom of the original screen, it should come up with another thing. And you can just choose, de just leave it. Don't change anything. You just press share, little blue button at the bottom right. It's the second okay, screen. And, and the, oh, it says open system preference. I. Oh yeah, you might. Yeah, your computer might not permit Zoom to um, share your screen. Are you all right without your PowerPoint, or do you want to send it to me? And maybe um, go I'll try to to send it to you. Um, where do you want me to send it to you? I'll just in the chat put my email. Okay. I think it will take time. I would just like go without the PowerPoint uh, presentation. That's all right. Yeah. So, uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, all good. Yeah. So uh, my paper is entitled Traumatic Modernity, Traumatized Periphrides, a, a Trans-Indigenous Reading of Colonial Trauma, Traumas in Kim Scott's uh, novel Taboo and Tommy Orange there there. So before starting, allow me to read this quote from uh, Thomas King's uh, memoir uh, entitled The Truth About Stories, uh, a Native Narrative. Uh, quote, uh, the Aboriginal people I was told were failing. They were dying off. They were dying off at such rate that they wouldn't last another decade. It was sad to see them passing away, but their problem, according to the men who gathered in the bar after work, was that they didn't have the same mental capacities as whites. There was no point in educating them because they had no interest in improving their lot and were perfectly happy living in poverty and squalor. The curious thing about these stories was I had heard them before, knew them in fact by heart. So uh, my paper explores the representation of the collective impact of colonial traumas in two novels emanating from uh, two indigenous literary traditions and geopolitical contexts. It presents a trans-indigenous reading of taboo by the Aboriginal Australian uh, Noongar author, Kim Scott, and there there by the Native American Cheyenne and Arapaho uh, author, Tommy Orange. Focusing on the literary representation of the socio-cultural and political economic aspects of colonial traumas, the paper investigate the, the investigates the aesthetic and formal devices that register the trauma of, the peri of peripheral modernities and the mechanisms of political, economic, and social oppression injured by indigenous peoples in the peripheries of the core capitalistic zones of what is known today as, uh, as Australia and the United States. I approach the works from the perspective of the literary theories of combined and even development proposed by the Warwick Research Collective. Uh, drawing on the word systems theory, the red contributors argue that literary text emanating from distinct peripheries and semi-peripheries in the word capitalistic system share thematic, formal, and aesthetic similarities in registering, quote, the harsh glare uh, of past and present imperial and colonial dispensation, quote, in articulating the problem of modern capitalistic imperialism and in aesthetically encoding the conflict between core and, uh, core and semi-peripheries in the capitalistic word system. As two literary texts of this kind, I, agree with, I, I argue that Dether and Tabu capture the, tra the traumatic effects of, of, of the capitalistic imperialism and, and, and its uneven modernization, not only through explicit thematic representation, but also through formal, stylistic, uh, through formal stylistic and aesthetic features. Uh, as will become apparent, both authors use realistic narrative modes undermined by a catalog of uh, irrealist aesthetic to provide a little representation of the inc incongruity and the unevenness of the colonial capitalistic modernization and the traumatic effect it endangered among the indigenous peoples uh, represented in the novels. So in the prologue of uh, There's There, uh, Tommy Orange writes, quote, some of us grew with stories about massacres, stories about what happened to our people not so long ago, how we came out of it, quote. Describing the Sand Creek massacre of 1864, Orange st states that it happens, quote, not so long ago, highlighting how these stories continue to shape the native collective memory in contemporary time. And using the pronoun, quote, us to include himself as, himself as a descendant of those who suffered uh, directly this genocide. Similarly, Kim Scott in, uh, in Taboo, uh, the novels open with, opens with, quote, our hometown was a massacre place. People called it Taboo. They said it is haunted and you will get sick if you go there, quote. Scott, Scott builds his novel around the Kukanaruk massacre of 1881, um, uh, perpetrated by white settlers against the Aboriginal uh, Australian Noongar people. So like Orange, he stresses its lingering effects. However, while Orange conveys this through the title of his essay, quote, Massacre as Prologue, Scott is more implicit, using the past tense to refer to the, to the original massacre and then switching to the present and future tenses in the subsequent sentences in, quote, it is haunted and you will get sick. So while emanated from distinct indigenous uh, literary traditions and despite the contemporaneity of uh, their events, Scott and Orange agree on the need to go back in their respective histories to anchor their, pl the, their plots uh, in the massacres that colonialism perpetrated against their respective peoples. Through the novel's themes, forms, and styles, and the juxtaposition of different narrative registers, 
Orange and Scott expose the ongoing socio-economic and political oppression produced by neo-colonial capitalistic modernities and their uneven and traumatic material, cultural, social, and existential conditions lived by indigenous peoples in the peripheries of those called capitalistic countries. This is made apparent, for instance, at the start of There There, when Tony Loneman, one of the characters of the novel, speaks of his tormented life as a Native American with an absent father and a jailed alcoholic mother, as well as the shame of having a face distorted by fetal alcohol syndrome. He explains that his grandmother tells him of the suffering endured by Native, Ameri Native American uh, communities. She makes him read Native American novels to her, which he appreciates, even if he does, he does not always understand them. He declares, quote, when I do get it, I get it way, way down at that place where it hurts, but feels better because you feel it. Something you couldn't feel before reading it. That makes you feel less alone, and it's like it's not gonna hurt uh, as much anymore. Tony affirms, uh, affirms that these novels allow him to comprehend his pain, uh, understanding his suffering as part of something larger than himself. A collective pain felt across Native American communities. This is further highlighted, highlighted when he refers to a Native American Chippewa, Chippewa writer, Lewis Eldridge, reading a passage from one of her novels about, quote, how life will break you, how that's the reason we're here. Quote, his grandmother ex exclaimed that that is, quote, devastated. By referring to a Native American Chippewa author, Orange indicates that this pain is not only a collective phenomena, but also a transindigenous one. The, the self-conscious uh, intertextuality shows what the red contributors understand as, a as the structural analogies that exist between different literary texts by virtue of being located within a shared geography of combined and uneven development. In this way, Orange con conceptualizes colonial trauma as a trans transindigenous phenomenon across, across North America. Uh, Orange undermines the novel's realistic mode through uh, the injection and the juxtaposition of opposing irrealist narrative registers and different spatial uh, temporal realities. The recontributors explain that the telescoping uh, function of combined and even development, quote, could be articulated in semi-peripheral texts through a form of time travel within the same space, a spatial bridging of unlike times, and the production of unt untimely space, unquote. Speaking about the screenplay that uh, his uncle is writing, Donny Exedin, one, uh, one of the characters of the novel, declares, I'm gonna have an alien technology colonize America. We'll think we made it up, like it's ours. Over time, we'll merge with the technology. We'll become like androids, and we'll lose the ability to recognize each other. The way we used to look, our old ways. We won't really even consider uh, ourselves half-breeds, half-aliens because we think it's our technology. So we perceive here a parallel between uh, the science fiction narrative or uh, metaphor of alien invasion and the Western colonization of the Americas. Indeed, as the contributor, contributors argue, semi-peripheral writers might take the present social order of, of the semi-peripherality and project it into a narrative of future to portray the instability, the instability of a mixed past and future system characterizing global capitalism and its modernization. In this way, Orange not only dramatizes Western colonization and its assimilation and deculturation policies, but also reflect on the instability of the global capitalist system and its destructive modernization. Contrastingly, Orange returns to the past to speak of how the geno genocidal histories of colonization are recorded from a Western perspective as a one big heroic adventure across an empty forest. To do this, he recalled a real historical event, the occupation of Alcatraz by the United uh, Indians of all tribes, at which point Opal, one of, another character, is speaking to her teddy bear. Ted, uh, he, the name of Ted, this teddy bear is Teddy Two Shoes. Addressing Opal, Two Shoes explains that uh, how Theodore Roosevelt, during a, a bear hunting session, refuses to uh, shoot an old bear. When newspapers publishes a comic depicting him as a merciful nature lover, Stuffed bears are made and called teddy's bear, which morphs, in, which morphs into teddy's bear, teddy bears. But Tushu states that the newspaper re reported half the story. Rather than shooting the bear, Roosevelt slit that old be bear's throat. It's that kind of mercy they don't want you to know about. Quote. Indeed, this, remind the, the, uh, this reminds Orange reader of Roosevelt's famous words, quote, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians 
as dead Indians. Uh, the speaking teddy bear echoes the Rex, the Rex assertion that one, direct, one of the dialectical images that register the essence of combined and even modernity in, includes discrepant encounters, alienation effects, surreal uh, cross linkages, uh, and unidentified freakish objects, and likely likeliness across barriers of language, period, and territory. Quote. Orange distorts the spatial temporality of the novel by looking back at Alcatraz, endowing the space with an acute political, cultural, and metaphysical significance. According to the REC, spatial temporal distortion in semi peripheral literary texts capture the effect of an uneven and incommensurable capitalistic modernity. Orange shows that just as the bear was killed and commodified, so too were Native Americans killed and commodified in hyperreal images that appear, quote, on flags, jerseys, and coins. Tabu introduced, uh, uh, Kim, Kim Scott's uh, novel, Tabu introduces Dan Horton, whose, proper, whose property is the site of a 19th century massacre against the Aboriginal Noongars, which occurs when one, when one of Dan's ancestors is killed by the Noongars for raping a 14 years old girl, uh, Aboriginal girl. A peace, park, a peace park will be opened on the massacre site as an act of remembrance and reconciliation. Tilly Kuhlman, the protagonist of the novel, had been fostered by Dan and his wife, along with their uh, son, Duke, until she is returned to, to, she is returned to her birth uh, mother, until she is returned to, to her birth mother. Visiting Dan Horton's property, Tilly, along with uh, her father's twin cousins, Gerard and Gerald, discuss the massacre, and Gerard reminds Tilly that descendants of the victims never return to the town. Quote, you know, most blackfellas uh, never even stop uh, in Kipaloop because of what happens, that murderer, quote. And quote, not many blackfellas been here for a long time since, everybody, since nearly everybody was wiped out. This repetition registers the, registers the technique Scott employs to involve the readers in understanding of the continuous effect of this particular genocide and more generally, all genocide perpetrated by, perpetrated by white colonization, uh, by Western colonization against Aboriginal Australians. Scott also registers this aesthetically, as the idea is repeated in two uh, instances involved, involving Tilly's father. Uh, once arrived at Dan's property, Gerard tells Tilly that her dad never really been here. He knowed to wind up uh, the windows of, of his car and keep driving because of the massacre. See. The other twin said, um, well, sorry, the other twin said, till his father doesn't stop when he passes the town, he closes his car's windows as though something may penetrate. Later, later one of the Aboriginal elders invited to the Peace Park, uh, to the Peace Park states, massacre country, they say, lot of people reckon it's taboo, but spirit everywhere, everywhere. You know, they roll up their car windows while passing through Kipalu and not even stop for food or petrol. Indeed, the REC interpreters argue that writers from semi-periphery and uh, peripheries and semi-peripheries embed irrealist vocabulary such as the Gothic in their text to register a reality that is inaccessible to realistic representation. Scott's deployment of aesthetic, uh, uh, of Gothic aesthetic through this injection of spectrality is thus an endeavor to register uh, the traumatic impact of the massacre. Describing Tilly's sequestration and rape by her foster uh, brother, Duke, Scott writes, she had the collar around her neck. Duke pulled, pulled on the leech and pointed to a bowl of dried dog biscuit on the floor. Tilly knew what he wanted. She ate, kneeling, lifted her, uh, lifted her pelvis up, remembered it later, amazed, disgusted, res uh, resigned to it happening again. In the evening, he sometimes chained her uh, with the dogs muzzled her so she could not call. Tilly roamed the, how, the house, grinding her, uh, grinding her teeth, bumping into door frames, lashing out in frustration. From a, micro, uh, from a macrocosmic uh, perspective and a historical perspective, the scene symbolizes the ongoing dehumanization of Aboriginal Australian communities involving a colonizer and a colonized. This sadomasochist rape is, according to the red contributors, an aesthetic subversion of the realist the realist style in semi-peripheral text. Sadomasochist and sexual violence scene, they, they explain, quote, can be understood as analogous to the crimes committed against the people and the land by the by capitalism's penetration of pre-capitalistic societies. Quote, 
Ferrutini's rape, Scott reflects on the wider colonial destruction, the rape of the land, the confinement of, the, of Aboriginal communities in suburbs, um, and, uh, and the, the, and the mer emergence of cities, and the, prevail the prevailing substance abuse that continue to destroy Aboriginal communities. Scott highlights the peripherization of Noong the Noongars, described in, uh, in the novel, in a description of a suburb of King jo Georgetown, where there are no means of transport. Quote, it's hard to leave, he says, suggesting an imprisonment as though the lack of transport is intentional, confining Aboriginal people to gentrify other places where the Euro-Australian uh, uh, Euro middle class live. In an article about Flin uh, Flinders, this, uh, this town, uh, titled King George uh, Towns Bronx, the paper, quote, the paper ran the usual photos of bare bummed and snotty nosed kids, car buddies, uh, weed infested yards, packs of stray dogs, groups of people uh, drinking in the playground park, quote. Flinders is, Flinders is compared to the Bronx, the poorest borough of New York City. So uh, if, as the contributors contend, modernity in an, in an economic logic of combined and even development, quote, is coded into the fabric of built spaces, quote, then this Australian peripheral town becomes an epitome of economic and even symbol of a peripheral modernity in a racially inscribed capitalistic country. So uh, as demonstrated throughout the paper, Tommy Orange and Kim Scott succeed in registering the destructive impacts of colonial genocide, whose traumatic residues still haunt the present collective memory of their people. This is done by grounding the fictional work in uh, actual historical massacres committed by Western colonization. Through the, de the deployment of specific themes, forms, and styles, as well as the juxtaposition of different literary levels and the narrative registers, including uh, anthropomorphisms, anachronisms, sci-fi metaphors, and phantasmagoria, the author exposed the, uh, the ongoing socioeconomic and political oppression of indigenous peoples in the peripheries and of core capitalistic zones, symptomatic of a neo-colonial and a racially inscribed capitalism. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Abdurra. That was really, really interesting. I think we're going to have a lot of really interesting questions coming up about that in a little while. Okay, so next up we have uh, Judith, whose research is titled Restore Me, the Process of Ethnic Positioning and the Renegotiated Identities in Southwestern Mixed Heritage Prose. Over to you, Judith. Thank you very much. And I need now um, Michael's technical help with fixing the PPT because I had the same technical issue like the previous presenter. And while we are doing this, let me express my gratitude to the Center for Indigenous Studies in Kent University for this particular conference, as well as their interest in and serious work that they devote to interdisciplinary approaches and collaborative and comparative approaches to um, such studies in and the whole area. And um, let me refer to some people um, that I have heard um, <clears throat> during the conference touching upon uh, topics that I might be related to. First of all, um, referring to Chloe and Alice, I also feel like an elephant in the room, but I promise to take special care of my size in the room. So I'm, I'm also an observer of indigenous studies from a Central European and Hungarian perspective, and I'm aware of all the limitations, and especially the shaky part, which is the sensitivity of um, talking about mixed heritage. Um, another um, way I can relate to this conference is that um, at the plenary, Professor Tatpunga Somerville mentioned this wonderful um, system of Fakapapa, and I checked on the internet quickly, uh, what I can learn about it and I felt so closely related and you will see why to the idea and it's too bad we don't have her any longer here with us because Fakapiri is another notion that I found establishing connections and I was wondering if we can do that backwards. So I might save that question um, to her. So um, continuing what the previous presentation and Abnanur has uh, touched upon um, trauma, nara, trauma and tabooing here we go with healing narratives in a way and so my focus and maybe you can um, help me with the second slide 
is actually um, indigenous and settler relations with special regards to identities beyond the indigenous and settler binary. So as you can see here, um, this is um, the whole focus of my broader research is mixed heritage, past and present cultural interactions in the Southwestern United States, reflected in visual arts and literature, mostly fiction, and uh, referring to some names that might uh, ring a bell to many of you, like Circo, Mama Day, Paula Gunn Allen, uh, Ovens, Joy Hart Joe, um, Linda Hogan, and for the visual artists, uh, Marla Ellison, Diego and Matteo Romero, Roxanne Swenzel, um, Bill Wilson, and Fitz Shoulders might be um, familiar with some of you. If not, make sure you check out those artists because they have wonderful stuff to share with you. So um, this is part of this presentation is part of a section of the upcoming book uh, under Lexington book, Books, and that's going to be uh, entitled Down Runners, Blood Trails, Ethnic Positioning in the Southwest Mis Mixed Heritage Writing. And you will see why and why I feel that this is an interesting um, approach to indigeneity and threshold approaches to indigeneity. Um, Next slide, please. So the narratives that I'm uh, actually interested in and deal with are written by and about individuals of Anglo-American and Native American heritage. And I became very excited about them because I feel that what Paul Logan Allen calls conflicting bloods the colonizer and the colonized in, their, in the ancestral life, lines makes people right from scratch, from birth, really, really develop frustrations, early childhood frustrations and many other inhibitions. Sorry, this is my dog in the background and I hope that this guy doesn't really want to contribute too much to the conference. He's a funny guy, but not too much now, right? Um, so, um, this time my focus is uh, return to indigenous roots and last um, February I part participated a conference in the Czech Republic where Ulla Hazenstein Stein, Professor Hazenstein mentioned that there is an increasing critical attention and awareness that return to the roots is not that easy at all and we shouldn't take a romanticized view on, on that at all. What I'm personally really excited about is the cognitive dissonance avoidance and tolerance that all these characters present us. And maybe we can also make uh, assumptions about our own cognitive dissonance avoidance and the way it is related to identity and identity recreation. And so the book has got a big uh, chapter on, um, on the um, psychology of dissonance avoidance. And I'm actually working uh, together with Professor Marta Fulop, who is an intercultural psychologist. And, um, and uh, this is very important to mention that uh, interdisciplinary approaches are, I think, very, very helpful for us. Um, identity reformulation always uh, incorporates um, fluidity, ethnic choices, and taking increasing control of one's own narrative from object to become a subject of your own story. And I think it's, it, it applies to um, indigenous and uh, post-colonial literatures all over the world, I would assume. So the previously stigmatized identities become self-conscious holders of uh, value assets. Actually, these value assets derive from uh, the blended uh, knowledge archives, memories, and cultural traits that these uh, characters bring um, to their lives or receive in their lives. And uh, they select and adjust and activate their identity consciously or uh, just partly consciously, um, even unconsciously. Um, so you can read about commitments to symbolic change, racial uncategorization, and especially exploring the limits of indigeneity in these narratives. Um, before I actually go to the specific um, field of um, the restoration stories, let me mention that Don in the morning session mentioned that um, 
uh, that there is an increasing interest in the correlation of space and connected in space and personal identity making and, and telling one's story. So there is another chapter in the book that I'm writing entitled Core and Confluence, which, which tackles this very issue. And so in case um, you are interested, I can, I can you know, send you some, some good stuff on that. Um, next slide, slide, please. So here you see three chapters and I'm just focusing on the third one. The first two, um, as opposed to um, the narratives that discuss the inability to fully recognize one's own ethnic choice, sphere of action, potentials, and the combination of indigenous and non-indigenous knowledge archives here in Restore Me, we can observe how a constructive attitude to one's own blended heritage develops. Circle's exemplary ceremony um, has formulated a major milestone in the history of mixed blood writing. Mama Day's The House Made It Down and The Ancient Child continue the circle tradition and emphasize the return to the ancestral ties motive. Ovens's Dark River and Nightland, as well as Harjo's Crazy Brave, de depict the return to some kind of a pan-nativism that is more spiritual than physical in its nature. Chadwick Allen is, explores um, this recovery as a return to normal, obtaining a usable substance, source, and value. So now let us turn towards symbolic and psychosocial reparation in recent Southwestern prospects, where this reparation is always closely related to the land, the rediscovered place of well being and homing. As Harjo's text presents, Land for um, authors um, uh, around the millennium is now considered not as a dwelling place in a strict sense, but more as a space of confluence where one can identify with, one can develop, define her, herself in relation to that land, while at the same time crossing its boundaries. As for the act of recovery, re-tribalization, re-acculturation, the majority of Native American and mixed blood people nowadays are urban and may lack, um, may lack actually daily contact with tribal community of their ancestry. Retribalization may also imply something similar to Indianization, going primitive, weekend warriorhood, or a romanticized, that is, selective enactment of one's indigenous cultural ties. As for critical treaties on homing, earlier the motif of medicine pass, quote and unquote, walking the red road and running into the red lights occasionally, as Bragi says, referred to the rediscovery of and celebration of indigenous roots in literature. Here we don't mean the neo-indigenous awakening to reconnect under new ageism, where non-indigenous peoples longing for a supposed ethnic identity applies. And that's what I discussed in the first book that you saw in the first um, slide. Homing here refers to an exploration of one's actual heritage. For another approach, pan-tribal connectedness, quote and unquote by, uh, from Lincoln, and blended heritage of the so-called fusion crossers characterize many of the mixed blood narratives. The general pattern of the joyful and energizing reclaiming and proclaiming of heritage make the given character feel that through active learning and participation in tribal culture, things start falling into place. Their individual lives receive meaning, new meaning and moral value. However, as also indicated in literature, return to one's indigen indigeneity is not very easy. Quote, I feel sometimes like I'm trying to track my ancestors down the red road with the wind blowing the footprints away, unquote. The letter especially applies to mixed bloods for many of them do not have a substantial relation and grounding in tribal culture. More recent criticism pays increasing attention to, this, uh, to the obstacles, challenges, and mixed impacts of re-indigenization, as I mentioned earlier. As for cure, on the one hand, the newly emerging science, emerging science of cross-cultural psychotherapy, indigenous psychology and ethnopsychology tackle the problem of internalized conflicts and frustrations. On the other hand, 
Literature offers healing narratives that call attention to problems entailed by the disparity between uh, author ascribed and ego recognized identities. It gives voice to marginalized ones and facilitates the process of identity renegotiation, devictimization, and empowerment. Most blended heritage persons have experienced mixed feelings from full blood res or Pueblo dwellers, even relatives who question their alliances and refuse to validate their tribal membership. Thus, outer acceptance is not secured at any level. Can we move to the next slide, Michael? So as I, I guess most of you know, ceremony, circle ceremony, uh, is the one that I'm just briefly touching upon. I believe that Silco has laid the basic proposition for mixed blood existence. Instead of stressing the relevance of a literal, physical, and symbolic return to old ways, here, her novel suggests embracing one's heritage, creating an active presence in one's own life, and relying on the cultural archives that may support this presence in an ad adopted fashion. Rituals and ceremonies reestablish the communal relatedness and may elevate and even free the individual while strengthening his or her cohesion with the community. Rituals have, a special, uh, have special relevance for mixed blood persons since there is an added value of practicing ceremonies. They allow the individual an expression of his or her ethnocultural alliances, making a statement of belonging, which is indirectly a value judgment, selection, and prioritization. Next slide, please. I have a number of um, on texts that um, I would love to share with you, but I decided to, to focus on Ovens' Nightland only and then leave you with that story. Um, so the story of the two half-blood boys, Will and Bill Kinney, is a Cherokee family history continued in New Mexico. The brothers seem like two faces of the same person. Will is a tradition-bound person, while Bill is more open and adaptive. When they were kids, the sorcerer and honorary grandfather, Sikani, mentioned them uh, a buried treasure and an ancient kinship. And uh, now, um, Sikani can perceive some disturbance happening, which is symbolized by an emerging storm. Night, night walkers are coming. Bill is always questioning the validity of these instinctual and visionary thoughts and believes that there are some kind of a Cherokee hocus pocus like always, and to hell with that Indian stuff. On the contrary, Will feels an emerging need to make sense of his life, to understand some patterns that appear in order to avoid going crazy. Will is reluctant to get back to cattle ranching, but the ranch needs water and he also needs revitalization. He is pushed out of his comfort zone and starts his spiritual journey, the metamorphosis, uh, begins here. Mixed bloods physically and spiritually fluctuate between the city and the res, modern life, conveniences, and tradition, assimilation, and native resistance. Will is complex in the sense that, as a mixed blood individual, the son of a white woman and the red faced man, his acceptance in the local community and his feelings of belonging are more ambivalent. This identification maze points at a question. How could someone remain a stranger to his own parents and people for a lifetime? In the last part of the novel, a couple of positive symbols emerge and indicate the profound change in Will's vision and attitude. Down runners appear and he is tempted to join them, finding the ceremony of the run transformative, elevating, and uniting him with the soft net of the community he had had no awareness of. The old house turns into a home when the long separated wife, Jace, returns and the room gets filled with light and affection. Since um, the promise, sorry, it's just, I received a phone call and that's too bad. Okay, so thunder and rain, the garden getting water also signify new life and revitalization. Sikani ritually sends smoke to four directions signaling that the circle of life has its end and new beginning. The letter is also implied by both holies expecting the baby, the grandchild of Will and Jace, 
and their act of taking sickeny their elder in the home in their home the somewhat romantic happy ending of the story underlines the fundamental need for psychological, social, and moral resolution, clo closure if you need, if you wish, proper bounding that are extremely important for all, but especially for mixed heritage persons. So um, moving to the last slide. Instead of, a, I hope you like it. Um, Will Wilson is one of my favorite photo artists of mixed heritage. So instead of a conclusion um, that actually I'd like to provide in the book uh, entitled Down Runners, um, I would like just to briefly mention that for, for, um, for, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So for mixed heritage persons, this is the postman, by the way, mixed heritage persons, um, there are basically four choices and um, four psychological and ethnocultural choices. They either feel that they are in a vacuum of in-betweenness, cultural in-betweenness, or they um, choose a single identity. They go Indian, they go native, or they stay white. Uh, third choice could be hybridity, which is acknowledge blended heritage and utilize blended um, uh, knowledge archives. And the fourth um, choice is racelessness, which is refusing to discuss race, refusing to identify with any particular racial category. Um, there are multiple factors, but I believe that um, what I mentioned uh, as uh, cognitive dissonance avoidance, this is the core, one of the core elements or factors that will uh, decide if a fact, if a person, a particular person in a particular uh, phase of life chooses or highlights his or her identity as in between, as single ethnic, as um, hybrid or, or non-racial. So thank you for your attention. And I have some more slides about um, the voter symbol and um, stuff like that, but I wouldn't like to take time from the questions. So I just leave you with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Judith. Okay, so next up, I'm gonna kind of rush along my uh, segues here. So uh, uh, next up, please welcome Ananya, who is okay. So last but not least is Doro whose presentation is titled Problems and Possibilities of Transcultural Knowledge Transfers, Native North America, in N. Scott Momaday and Lisa Lot Wellscoff Henrik's fictional works. Over to you, Dora. All right. Thank you for the introduction and also thank you for the inv invitation. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to be here today, and I think it's very urgent manners if I listen to the other talks um, that are addressed, and I hope we can continue to have these conversations for a very long time. Um, I'm going to talk for 15 minutes, I'm going to read off my paper, um, and I'm not a technological, very experienced person, so I'm having to look slightly to the left and can't really address the camera. Okay, I'm starting. Um, this talk is part of a larger research project called Side by Side, Reading Indigenous and Non-Indigenous Literature. In this research, I ask how Euro-Western scholars can establish a respectful and informed relationship to indigenous intellectual tradition inventions if they, like myself, come from a culture in which stereotypical ideas about indigenous peoples have been pervasive. To answer this question, I follow the lead of Cree scholar Willie Ehrman, who has argued that it is necessary to establish rules of engagement in transcultural settler colonial context zones to restore the autonomy of indigenous peoples and their knowledges. I strive to put Ehrman's suggestions into an analytical and methodological practice by reading indigenous and non-indigenous literature on native North America side by side. This means that when I analyze literary works, I intend to proceed in a manner that respects distinct ways of understanding and being in the world and for narrating experiences. The idea is to embed the chosen works within their specific cultural, historical, sociopolitical context and narrative traditions, and to see how the selected topics are stylistically and narratively expressed. 
by putting different narratives of seeing and being in the world alongside each other, as expressed in literature on Native North America from both sides of the Atlantic, reading side by side pluralizes worldviews. This methodology pays respect to indigenous claims to sovereign particularity, while it simultaneously demonstrates the transnational importance of indigenous knowledges as expressed in narratives. To demonstrate how to read side by side, I will analyze the acclaimed novel House Made of Dawn by Kiowa writer, painter, and scholar, Navary Scott Momaday, alongside the East German writer and scholar, Lisa Lotte Welskop Henry's Harker Sexology. In 1969, Momaday won the Pulitzer Prize with House Made of Dawn. Many scholars agreed that Momaday's achievement have paved the way for a new generation of highly successful Native American writers like Leslie Marmon Circle, James Welch, or Gerard Bissner in the 1970s and 1980s. In the assessment of Cherokee scholar Jace Weaver, Momaday's influence did not wane even decades after he emerged on the literary scene. He also had to quote, shape criticism of Native American literature more than any other single author or work, unquote. The first wave of scholars who focused in the wake of red power movements on indigenous writing have honed the critical understanding of indigenous narrative traditions by analyzing Momaday's narrative and poetic texts. Often, these researchers investigated into Momaday's sense of place that they described as being interrelated to indigenous temporalizations and understanding of time, to ideas about individual and collective being, and to the creative potential of storytelling and naming. When I compare Belskop Henry's Harker sexology to Momaday's House Made of Dawn, I will build up on these critical insights since my analysis will touch upon the depiction of space and place too. To be more precise, I will scrutinize how and to what effect the chosen text achieved vivacity, a term for a detailed verbal description that is intended to create a picture of a place, person, or action in the mind of the listeners. Vivacity is achieved, for instance, through ecrasis, which is the representation of visual, haptic, or oral objects in written or oral literature. I will align vivacity to Mombardai's ideas about the creative power of language to argue that the rhetorical devices employed decenter your authentic epistemologies in the minds of readers. In contrast, Lisa Lotte Belskop Henrich, a well known and widely read East German author, asks for historical justice when she describes the plight of Harker and, her, and his tribe. Her novels are written to incite her readers' feelings of solidarity with the plight and plight of indigenous peoples, yet she does not tackle the hegemony and dominance of European knowledge formations. I'm aware that it is highly critical to analyze European fiction about indigenous people. The influence that Elskop Heinrich exercised on the minds of her audience prompts me, however, to have a closer look at her writings to determine what politics of affect and knowledge she pursues. In The Way to Rainy Mountain, Kaya writer, painter, and scholar Navari Scott Momaday argues that it is imperative for human beings to dwell upon the experience and wonder of a particular landscape. Since the verb to dwell upon has a double meaning, Momaday artfully links the physical being on the land with thinking and or speaking at length about it. Furthermore, he connects the imperative to dwell upon with feelings of marvel and wonder with a sense and mating sense of experience. He sees these mental and central activities as evoked retrospectively. In his text, quote, a particular landscape, unquote, is likened to the remembered earth. He uses these terms interchangeably. Dwelling upon is thus an activity that goes beyond being at a place because it is an endeavor that needs time to unfold in sensing, experiencing, imagining, naming, and telling. Moreover, it needs a proper attitude that encompasses what Mama Day elsewhere calls a holy regard. As Lied Schwedinger explains in listening to the land, quote, to contemplate or think about the land one lives on is to imagine it, to know the history of it, and ultimately to have a spiritual and therefore moral sense of it, unquote. In this talk, I will argue that the spiritual moral sense towards plays that Mombaday expresses in his landmark novel, House Made of Dawn, is shaped by his expression of the interplay between natural forces like the sun and moon, rain, wind, thunder, and creation on earth. This interplay creates a relational aesthetics. 
For instance, Momodai recurrently depicts the interaction between sun and earth as mediated by light. Light is of particular importance in House Made of Dawn, as it is reflected by everything that one can find and perceive in a particular landscape. Even the title of the novel hints towards the interaction between sun and earth. Dawn marks the rising of the sun in the morning when the rays of the sun bring light to the world, creating a dwelling. Light also creates, through the interplay with objects that it falls upon, color. While light itself is invisible, we can learn about its existence because objects reflected, a reflection that our sensory experiences translates into specific colors. This effect is mimicked in House Made of Dawn, often commented upon by critics who have pointed out the, visual spe the specific visual qualities of the novel. The prologue, whose motives are repeated when the novel draws to a close, switches between colorful descriptions of the land from an initiant and a limited point of view. The evokes, quote, many colors on the hills and plains, bright with different colors, clays and sands, unquote, and highlights how the sunrise causes visual changes in the landscape. The protagonist, Abel, is outlined as a shivered, quote, against the winter sky and the long light landscape of the valley at dawn, unquote. In these descriptions, light creates a palette of colors that are rendered vividly in an ecstatic fashion. Similarly, sound is explored at length in How It's Made of Thorn. When Angela, one of the characters of focalizes, experiences a thunderstorm, especially her bodily perceptions and responses are detailed. Quote, the wind rose up under the eaves and the rooms of the Benavides house quaked and grew black. Angela drew herself up and waited. The intermittent drops of rain upon the roof seemed almost to subside. Then the first great slanting sheets of water drove against the cutter. So sudden and loud was the descent of the storm that she dug her nails into the heels of her hand and cowered instinctively. The intense wake of the sound engulfed her and she flung open the door and looked out. She could hear only the roar of the rain and the peal of the thunder breaking low and overheard in the hanging darkness. She could see only the flashes of lightning and the awful gray slant of the flood, pale and impenetrable, splintering upon itself and cleaving her vision like pain. Angela's reaction to the sudden sounds of the falling rain and the descent of the storm are first and foremost described as an instinctive attempt to protect herself against harm by cowering and by taming her instinct to fight or flight by attacking her own flesh with her nails. The successive effort to gain overview of the situation by opening the door and looking outside is only partly successful. Her perception is shown to be delimited by thunder, lightning, rain, and darkness. These are forces that overwhelm her senses. Furthermore, the situation seems to leave no room for any thought, which consequently play no part in the description. The privileging of sensual responsive, kinetic, visual, oral, these are the forces of nature, is another instance of an expressis used to create vivacity. These are two examples from a novel that to me is first and foremost about characters being in, off, and from the land. Land is shaping the characters' perceptions, yet to truly belong, language and storytelling traditions are needed as well. The first part of the novel, for instance, depicts the main protagonist Abel's experiences during the first days that he's back in Valotava, Echemes Pueblo village in the Canyon de San Diego, after he served as a soldier in World War II. It is described that he lost his ability to communicate in his tribal language, becoming, quote, inarticulate, unquote. He also arrives heavily drunk, possibly because he's prone to alcohol abuse. Yet when he walks into the canyon, he almost finds peace of mind. It is told that he, quote, wanted to make a song out of the colored canyon, the way the women of Torreon made songs upon their looms of colored yarn, but he had not got the right words together. It would have been a creation song. He would have sung lowly of the first world, of fire and flood, and of the emergence of dawn on the hill. When Abel thus knows what he needs, namely a creation song, he's not able to find the right words. At the very end of the novel, it seems as if Abel has learned to articulate the song of creation that he had almost lost. Quote, he went run running on its rise, unquote, seemingly being restored to its, his balance. I will come back to the importance of finding the right words when I discuss Momaday's ideas of language. Unsurprisingly, the sense of place in East German writer Welskop Henry's work on indigenous North America 
lacks the sophisticated relational aesthetics that Momida de develops in House Made of Dawn. Consider, for example, the Haka sexology's beginning. Quote, the night was windless, not a single leaf, not one of the pinned twigs move. The bark of the trunk was, all, was still moist, almost wet, on the side of the mountain slope open to the northeast. The snow has, had, had melted under the first warmth of spring. High on the slope, by a wooden root, an Indian ball crouch, crouched. He did not move, so that the creatures of the night only noticed him by smell. The eyes of the boy were directed at a spot of light. Many boys would have sought consolation in the darkness and loneliness of the mountain forest in that glimmer of light. But Haka Steinhardt Nachtauge, his name Haka Hartstone Night Eyes, the Dakota boy knew nothing of fear in the night between trees, rocks, and animals. This passage illustrates how the landscape serves literally as the setting for its main protagonist, Haka, the 11 year old son of a Dakota chief called Matataupa. Furthermore, the description of the location that is dark, windless, wet, rocky, lonely, and there are animals gives rise to a characterization of Haka as fearless and adapted to his surroundings. His name Night Eye indicate, indicates that he might see in the dark that engulfs him, and while the area is rocky, he himself is hard as stone, as his name implies too. Haka thus fits into the landscape without any mediation. He lacks an alienation from the environment that has been crucial in Momaday's description of Abel's relationship to his surroundings. For my side-by-side -side, side -side reading, this difference is crucial. It gives away that Welskop Hemrich, despite a lifelong study of plain Indians' different cultures and histories, is nevertheless influenced by a romanticizing view on indigenous peoples that sees them as being closer to nature. This is an idea of indigenous peoples as noble savages that has circulated in Europe since the beginning of colonialism, for instance, in the writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It is noteworthy that such a depiction exists, although Welskop Henry's explicitly reprobates any romanticizing of indigenous peoples. In an unpublished essay called Indians and Us, she writes, quote, the overwhelming abundance of literature on so-called Indians in Germany carries the danger that the Indian is seen as standing outside of human reality. This is similar to dressing up for an adventure in one's leisure hours and taking the dress off when the seriousness of real life approaches. The Indian can only win when he is lifted off his, off his pedestal and can appear as our brother." Unquote. Especially the formulation, can appear as our brother, gives a way to which further influences Welskop Henry succumbs in her writing. The cathexis for enduring engagement with indigenous peoples, which led her to join and support the Red Power Movement in the 1960s and 1970s, is stemming from a strong belief in international solidarity and brotherhood. These discursive tropes were very present in the social movements of that area, as well as in the public discourse of socialist states like the GDR, where Welskop Henrich lived after World War II. This internationalist outlook finds its expression in numerous passages of her archive, archive correspondences and interviews too, as well as in the reactions of her readers. In the archival holdings on Welskop Heinrich in Berlin, many documents give evidence of signature campaigns for Russell Means and of fundraising campaigns for indigenous self-governed school. The files record a lively international exchange between members of the AIM and young East and West Germans, as well as with Welskop Heinrich, uh, Heinrich herself, who was cordially called grandmother. It is my thesis that Welskop Heinrich's depiction of land is thus not only influenced by century-old romantic ideas about indigenous people's close connection to it in the European mind, the discourse on the retrieval of indigenous land and spirituality, key demands in red power movements, equally influenced her. These demands circulated well beyond North America, as demonstrated by the archi archival records and in Welskop Henry's novels, especially when she later started to write about contemporary social struggles. Questions of land retrieval and spirituality are also central in Momaday's writing, yet his approach is more sublime when he shapes new and recovers old epistemological visions through narrative form. His use of ekphrases to which he achieved liveliness is a major example. Ekphrasis is the rhetorical description of objects perceived through visual, oral, kinetic, or olfactory senses. In the case of House Made of Dawn, 
the central experiences of colorful landscapes, bodily actions and reactions, or sounds are described. When these objects are depicted in writing, writing, readers need to consider how they would perceive them in the real world, engaging in an act of imagination through which they become co-creators of the story told. It is this semiotic activity of readers that Momadek aims for as a storyteller. His vivid description performs what Catherine Wainwater has called a semiotic counter-conquest that does not result in, quote, domination and empire, but social reform through relocation of non-Indian people from positions of authority, positions of listeners and receivers of knowledge, unquote. Momadai thereby counteracts our ex-Euro-Western hegemony while gifting us with the beauty of the word. Thank you.